blessed us with another opportunity, another opportunity to, to study the Word of God um, this afternoon, this Sunday afternoon. So I pray God's blessings upon you. But let me pray to begin uh, this Bible study. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you for being good. We thank you for being great. And we certainly thank you for being God. You've been wonderful to us. So continue to bless, bless, strengthen, keep, and encourage everyone who watches this Bible study. God, you bless. God, you heal. God, you deliver. And do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord, Sister Pam. Good to have you joining us. Today's topic is stubbornness. Today's topic is, is stubbornness. Let me give you a Webster's definition of it. That word stubborn, having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. Now that's not Bible, that's Webster's de definition. So obviously, obviously, whether being stubborn uh, is good or bad depends upon what you're being stubborn about. Let me repeat that. Whether being stubborn is a good thing or a bad thing obviously depends on what you're being stubborn about. For example, if it is... Um, it's a good thing, it's a good thing to be stubborn if you are doing God's will. Hear that now. It's a good thing to be stubborn if, I-F, if you are doing God's will. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise the Lord, Sister Lisa. Um, what we're talking about, what we're talking about today is stubbornness. And I gave kind of a Webster's definition of stubbornness, having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. And what we've talked about is simply the basic fact that being stubborn can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, it just depends on what you are being stubborn about. And what we have just read from 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 is a verse of scripture that lets us know it's good to be stubborn if you are doing the will of God, if you are operating in the will of God. In short, there should be no escape hatch we look to when all is not going well when we are operating in God's will. We need to be stubborn to do that which is good. We find in the Gospel of Luke, let me give you another portion of scripture, the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. We're going to look at verses 59 through 62. So again, today we're talking about stubbornness, stubbornness. And usually when you hear that word immediately, immediately you think of a negative but it depends on what you're being stubborn about. Um, Luke 9 and 59, and he said unto another, follow me. Jesus said to another, follow me. But he said, he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord, Sister Leah. Good to have you. What we're talking about is stubbornness. And what we first looked at, what we are first looking at uh, are scriptures that reaffirm that stubbornness can be good if you are doing the will of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And here in the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 59 through 62, Jesus is confronted, he is confronted with people who give uh, what, one, what people might consider to be good reasons, good arguments, um, uh, not to be following the will of God. In other words, let me go and first bury my father. Um, or let me go and bid them farewell, which are at home. Some people would say, that, 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 that's reasonable. That's something that ought to be a good thing to do. But what Jesus is saying is, no, no. Um, if I say it, move and don't look back. If I give you a command, you move and don't look back. Praise the Lord. Uh, Deacon and Training Devon, good to have you. I hope you're feeling better. We're talking about stubbornness. And uh, one of the things that we focused on is, uh, at this early stage in the Bible study, is it's good to be stubborn if you are doing the will of God. If you, you become dogged in your determination, you don't change positions, you don't become wishy-washy, I believe in the book of James, the first chapter, I believe it's the eighth verse, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. God wants you to be determined. He wants you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. We've also looked at Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 59 through 62, where people were giving reasons, some would say good reasons, uh, not to immediately follow the words of Jesus, but when you are doing the will of God, when you're doing the will of God, be stubborn about it. Do God's will. Don't look back for no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I want you to consider, just consider for a moment, uh, Paul's account of his journey in preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, stubbornness is having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 33. Here is Paul telling us what he's gone through. He says in verse 24, of the Jews five times have I received uh, um, times received, I 40 stripes, save one. In other words, they beat me 39 times. Thrice, three times, was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Right? In journeys often, in perils of waters. In other words, I've been in a dangerous place in the waters. In perils of robbers, in perils of my own country, and in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. You know, when you start thinking about these things, and we're going to hold on, we're not going to move, we're going to keep going in this scripture, but if you think about these, these would have been good reasons for some to just say, wait a minute, doing this preaching thing, and I got to go through all of this? Forget, forget that. These are good reasons not to, but, but, but Paul was stubborn about preaching the gospel, and it's okay to be stubborn when you are doing the will of God. Verse 27, he says, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, am I, and am I not weak, who is offended, and I burn not, if I must needs glory, I will glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artaeus, the king kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. That's a reason not to be doing it, a good reason. He says, and through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. 
He, oh, he endured great pain, great hardship, but yet he was stubborn about doing the will of God. And so should we. Praise God. Um, I see a, a comment, a wonderful comment from Sister Leah. She said, uh, that's a great point, Pastor. I've always saw being stubborn as a word immediately uh, associated with sin. But when it's done in Christ, it's godly. Amen. 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 Again, stubbornness can be good. It can be bad. It just depends on what you're being stubborn <clears throat> about. When it comes to God, we have to have that I'm going to ride or die mentality. That I'm, I'm with it. I'm with God. No matter what. And, and there will be times, here's the thing, the, the reason why it's so important to have that kind of stubborn mentality when you are doing the will of God is because there will be times when it's going to get lonely in terms of people. There won't be much people around you patting you on your back, encouraging you. So what happens? In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, we see an example of what we ought to do to stay with that stubborn mentality, stubborn to do the will of God. 1 Samuel 30 and 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Notice this, notice, notice. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The fact of the matter is, in order to stubbornly do the will of God, there will come times in your life where you're going to have to encourage yourself because there won't be anybody around to encourage you. You have to encourage yourself, okay? Now, but I want us to focus on, we're about to shift now. We're about to make a quick shift because I want to talk about a different kind of stubbornness. I do want to discuss the negative aspect of stubbornness. Amen. Uh, Sister Leah was talking about, when she, you know, when she hears that word stubbornness, you know, you immediately think of sin. Well, stubbornness is wrong when you're being stubborn about wrong. <laughs> stubbornness is wrong when you're being stubborn about your wrong. You would turn with me, turn with me, to the Psalms, the Old Testament, the Psalms, the 32nd Psalm, the 32nd Psalm, and verse 9. The 32nd Psalm and verse 9. So here's, here's the word of the Lord in the Psalms. Be ye not, N-O-T not, as the horse or as the mule, I'm going to come back to that, which have no understanding. I will come back to that word, understanding. Whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Now, I am sure you've heard the old folks say, boy, don't be stubborn as a mule. Okay, well, that's not, that's not a compliment <laughs> when the old folks are saying that to you. Now, the word of God says, be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. That word understanding here in Psalms 32 and 9 comes from a Hebrew word which means to separate mentally or distinguish, to consider, to discern, have intelligence, perceive, be prudent. Listen, let me repeat it. Here, understanding, which have no understanding, means they have uh, they're not able to separate mentally or distinguish, consider, learn, have intelligence, perceive, be prudent. In short, when one is stubborn, is as stubborn as a mule in their wrong, it means that they cannot separate mentally or distinguish good from bad. When you are stubborn as a mule in your wrong, you lack the ability to consider all your options. When you're stubborn as a mule and you're in your wrong, you're not discerning. Intelligence has escaped you. <clears throat> you fail to perceive and thus be prudent. In short, when you are stubborn in your wrong, you can't think. 
ultimately, if you're stubborn in your wrong, you are a fool. When one is stubborn in their wrong, it is in part because they hate wisdom. I don't want you to think about that. All those things don't sound good. <laughs> not, not, not of those things, none of those things sound good. That um, being stubborn about wrongdoing means I'm a fool. I'm, I'm not thinking. I'm not. I'm lacking intelligence. I'm. Uh, I'm not discerning. But when you are stubborn and you're wrong, it's in part because you hate wisdom. You can't get around that. Proverbs, the first chapter. We're going to spend a little time in the book of Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom. The book of Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom. Praise be unto God. Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Notice this. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. When you have somebody who is wrong and don't want to be right, the secular song went, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Well, that's the, that is the mentality. Praise the Lord, Pastor Watson. Good to have you, sir. We're talking about, we're talking about stubbornness today. Um, and we, we gave that definition, kind of a Webster's definition of stubbornness, having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. And what we first, what we first observe is that if you are stubborn doing the will of God, that's a good thing. The Bible encourages that. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Jesus told his disciples, no man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And so it's good to be stubborn if you're doing the will of God. We've looked at um, the Apostle Paul, and he told us the problems that he went through. Uh, he was beaten and uh, five times with the Jews, 40 stripes, save one. And, you know, we, we, we're of the, we are so weak sometimes, it takes very little to convince us to move away from that which is right. It takes very little pain. But Paul listed this laundry list of problems and issues that he dealt with, but he stubbornly continued to preach the word of God because he realized and recognized he was in God's will. And also we talked about the fact that sometimes you just have to encourage yourself when you are doing God's will, stubbornly doing God's will, because you're not going to always have a bunch of people around you to encourage you. We have shifted. We've shifted. And we are beginning to look at um, the negative aspects of stubbornness. Um, and, and in fact, if you are stubborn in your wrong, the Bible describes you uh, as a mule which has no understanding. The old folks say stubborn as a mule. Well, you're as a mule which, which lacks understanding. And what we found in Proverbs, the first chapter, verse 7, is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, which, of course, is the classic, classic definition of someone who is stubborn in their wrongdoing. They despise wisdom and instruction. Somebody who's in sin, stubbornly in sin, they don't want to move out of their sin. They're not listening to any wisdom, any instruction that comes from a man or woman of God. They, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. When one is stubborn in their wrong, it's in part because they ignore knowledge. Proverbs 18 and 2. The Bible says a fool, a fool have no delight in understanding. And thus, an unwise person, the foolish, don't seek understanding. Look, the fact of the matter is there are reasons why some sinners will not come to your church. They don't want to hear it. They're not interested. <laughs> They're not interested in hearing what thus saith the Lord. Because in the back of their mind, they know if they start looking at life differently, it's going to require some change. And they're not prepared. When one is stubborn and they're wrong, here's the sad part. 
when you become stubborn in wrongdoing, it eventually leads to pain. I'm going to give you a portion of scripture from the book of Proverbs, the 18th chapter, the 6th verse. I'm going to first read from the King James Version. <clears throat> then I'm going to read from the NIV. Okay, I'll read from the King James Version, then the NIV. The King James Version, Proverbs 18 and 6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth <clears throat> for strokes. The NIV says, the lips of a fool bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. Uh, this is the classic when keeping it real goes wrong. Uh, when, when you take the position as a fool to be stubborn in your wrongdoing. You can look on YouTube any day, and you'll see, you'll see someone who gets pulled over by a police officer. All of a sudden, they're telling the police officer what they can't do. You can't arrest me. You can't. And next thing you know, why are you tasing me? Why are you tasing me? Being stubborn in your wrongdoing will lead to pain. And that's why we, as people of God, we should never be stubborn in wrong. We can be stubborn and right all day long and take a beating for being right. But not in our wrong. Not in wrong. Hallelujah. When one is stubborn, here's something else. Here's another uh, facet of the personality. They will not ask for help. When they're stubborn and they're wrong, they're not even looking for anybody to help. We find that in the book of Proverbs, the 24th chapter, and verse 7. Proverbs 24 and 7. It says, wisdom is too high for a fool. Listen, he openeth not his mouth in the gate. Let me explain that. In Old Testament times, uh, the cities had walls around them and the cities had gates and the wise men would sometimes congregate at the gates. And what the Bible is saying is when somebody is foolish, in other words, they're stubborn in their wrongdoing, they won't even ask questions of wise people. They don't mind being around wise people, but they're not seeking the wisdom that wise people have and thus will not inquire, will not ask for help. You know, sometimes, sometimes you wonder somebody who is, you know, they're, they're, they're on the wrong track in life, but will not ask for help. They're on the wrong track. They're about to mess up really badly, and you kind of scratch your head and wonder, why are they continually heading in wrong? The fact of the matter is, a fool will not open his mouth in the gate. A fool is not going to ask for help. A fool is not going to seek wisdom because a fool does not delight in wisdom. When you're stubborn in your wrong in wrongdoing, you literally become a fool. Now, uh, if you have any questions or comments, by all means, place you know uh, note those questions, note those comments, and I'm not saying I'm going to be able to answer them immediately. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Amen. Hallelujah. We're not going to fake it till we make it. Uh, one of the things, now, I'm, we're, I'm about to keep going on this, um, along this line that we've been discussing, because the next question is, how can we avoid being stubborn about wrongdoing? How can we, as people of God, uh, avoid being stubborn in wrong. And we're about to deal with that. But really, one of the things that I want you to see, want you to see in the Word of God, is how self-destructive it is to be wrong, to stay wrong, and not look for right. It only ultimately hurts the person who is in the wrong. Amen. It only hurts that person, ultimately. Let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Proverbs, the 11th chapter, and verse 14. How can we avoid being that person who is stubborn about doing the wrong thing? Before I read Proverbs 11 and 14, look, one of the things the Bible encourages us to do is to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Because sometimes 
if we ever start walking around in our conceit, believing we can do no wrong, that's when the devil is about to lick us. And I mean send a very bad blow our way. When we walk in self-deception, believing we can make no mistakes, we already made a mistake <laughs> because we are fallible. The beings are fallible. The only one who is infallible is God, is God, is God. And, you know, sometimes you just think, I'm making the right choice, I'm making the right decision. Well, um, except we follow biblical principles, except we follow those biblical principles, we can be in the wrong believing that we're right. You know, it just dawned on me. There's that scripture um, uh, that Jesus, um, it's a um, quote from Jesus, um, where Jesus is saying that many will say unto him, um, many will say unto him, you know, the great things that they have done. Um, and ultimately, you know, they will tell him that uh, they've done many miracles in his name. They, um, um, you know, great things they've done in his name. And he's going to say, depart from me. Your work was of iniquity. I never, I never knew you. Uh, depart from me. Your work was of iniquity. I never knew you. So the person really was walking around deceiving themselves, um, thinking that they were doing the will of God when they were not. I am referring to the Gospel of Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 through 23. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which he is in heaven. Listen, listen at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or preached in thy name? And in thy name have, have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonders? Says, and then I, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here's someone stubborn in what they were doing. I mean, determined what they were doing. Worse than that, deceiving themselves that they were doing the will of God when they were not. My God. So how can we avoid it? How can we avoid having to have that kind of conversation with God? My God, we certainly don't want to be those who are telling the Lord, you know, I've done this thing, I've been working on your behalf, and he goes, no, no, you weren't. <laughs> I never acknowledged you as doing my will. So how do we avoid that? How do we avoid being stubborn, doing the wrong thing? Proverbs 11 and 14. The Bible says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So here we go. That's one biblical principle. That's a biblical principle showing us how to avoid being stubbornly wrong. Hallelujah. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. See, what you? it's important for us. I think each and every one of us need mentors. I don't care if you're a pastor. You need a mentor. You need to be accountable to someone you know, thank God, um, Pastor Watson, myself, uh, many other pastors, we are a part of a wonderful body, the International Alliance of Apostolic Ministries. And so we have brothers, we have a presiding bishop, we, we have good people in our organization we can go to it and we can seek counsel from. So we don't have to be stubbornly wrong about something. I mean, as pastors, um, just to pull, you know, take you behind the curtain a little bit, Sometimes you're dealing with issues in people's lives. And, and obviously, you want to do the right thing. You want to say the right thing. Well, you may not always know what to say and how to say in any given situation. So thank God for uh, a multitude of counselors. Because in a multitude of counsel, there is safety. 
safety. But let me share this with you. Turn to Psalms 1. Turn to Psalms 1. The first three verses. Psalms 1, first three verses. It's not just that you get counsel. That counsel has to be godly counsel. Come on now. It's not just going out, you know, because let me tell you something. Sometimes when people are in their wrong, you know who they go to for counsel? Other people who they know will support them in their wrong. Okay? That's what happens. That's what happens. When people are in their other people, well, you know, I got a bunch of counsel. Well, is it God? Because the Bible tells us in Psalms 1, verses 1 through 